Okay, um, 1 Corinthians 2.13. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. The Apostle Paul understood that what he spoke was moved by the Holy Spirit. Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5.27. I put you under oath by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. So not only the, the Apostle Paul understood that what he spoke um, was Scripture, but he also understood that what he wrote as moved by the Holy Spirit was the inspired Word of God. It was Scripture. So in the letters to the Thessalonians, he's saying, I put you under oath that you go and you better read it. Okay? That's how important it was. Um, one way to, to view it is like, this is, so here's my, uh, my visual representation for today. There was a gentleman... Uh, that goes to this church, and he, he made these for a lot of the guys, and I thought they were so cool. And I told him I'll, if he did, I'd walk up here one day with this, but I thought it might be a little silly at first. But I can use it right now. So one of the commentaries that I talked about, so when we get into this idea of, of Paul writing Scripture, or you get into this idea of, of Peter or uh, John or just anyone in writing Scripture, and you, you bring into this, um, the concept that we are fouled human beings. Every, every human that's ever, been, that's ever existed and ever exists uh, is sinful. Well, the commentary put it this way. He said, it's like drawing a straight line with a crooked stick. Isn't that awesome? That's the idea. So I'm the crooked stick. Paul's, I'm the crooked stick presenting that Paul was the crooked stick as God drew the straight line of Scripture, right? You're going to remember that, I promise. You may not remember anything else, but you'll remember the stick. Um, okay, um, so... Uh, God drew a perfectly straight line with a crooked stick. Now, like I said, there's more to this idea. I can't exhaust it, um, and so we're not going to go any further with it. But there's, there's ideas like when they refer to the Old Testament writings. Um, Jesus, um, he reasoned whenever he was on the road to Emmaus. He reasoned with the guys from Moses and the prophets. So he showed who he was by going back to the Old Testament. Uh, it says in Romans, it talks about um, what, pr what privilege or what advantage did the Jews have. They had the oracles of God. So there's a whole other... Um, uh, there's a vast study that can be shown about the validity of, of this being Scripture. For, but for today, that's, that's all I have time to do. So anyway, right now, we understand this is Scripture, okay? So let's go back to our text, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God. We know, that scripture, we know what Scripture is, and we know the scope of Scripture. Plenary verbal, fully authoritative, every word, and perfectly inspired by God. Now let's look at the function of Scripture. So it goes on to say, uh, All Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, first we need to establish this. Just prior to this passage, Paul states something in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. He says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writing, Scripture, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. So basically what Paul is saying here is what Paul taught, what Paul wrote, and what was already established as God's sacred word was able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. First and foremost, Scripture is salvific. Okay? And all that means is that basically Scripture points to salvation. First and foremost, okay, it points to salvation. All, understand that. Grasp that. That is the, that is the, the most power uh, is that it points to um, salvation. Um, having the intent, no power to save. That's, that's what that means. But also at the end of verse 16, we'll go back to our passage today. All Scripture is, is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this idea a little bit. Uh, Mark 6.34, please. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So you get this picture that Jesus looks down on his people, and he sees them, and they're, they're just roaming around. They're just kind of lost, right? And he felt compassion for them. What did he do? He taught them. Uh, Jesus looked down into a lost generation of people, and, com and compassion compelled him to teach them. Teaching is important. Acts 17, 2. 
And according to Paul's custom, he visited them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. When Paul would roll up into town, everywhere he went, uh, the first thing he'd do is he'd find a synagogue and he'd go and reason or teach from the Scriptures. Everywhere he went, that's what he did. Um, if you think back to uh, when we were midway through 1 Timothy, we just finished 1 Timothy um, together, looking at the qualifications for a pastor elder, 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. It is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, skillful in teaching. You are not called to be an elder or pastor if you cannot teach. Okay, that's how important it is. Teaching is essential. Teaching is essential for belief unto obedience. In every profession, we'll go back to the profession thing again. In every profession or trade where there's a source of knowledge or information that sits authoritatively over the profession, the primary means by which it was conveyed is through teaching. That make sense? In anything you've ever done, any endeavor you've gone under, and you sat under authority of any kind of document or paper, whatever it was, school, whatever it is, it was the primary source that the information was tra uh, translated or conveyed was through a teacher. Teaching is important. Um, Paul writes in Romans 15, 4. He says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So, so not only do we find life in the Scriptures like I talked about, but we also find hope in the Scriptures. The outside world, this is crazy. So like I, I've said this many times, when you get into, when you start studying things like hope, love, joy, peace, all these things, happiness, whatever. Well, when you become a Christian, you have to redefine them from a Christian perspective. You have to redefine these things as they are seen now in your life. So what I mean by that is whenever you bring up this idea of, of life and hope, you need to understand that a non-believer cannot experience either. They have no access to life except through Christ, which we have, and they have no access to hope except through scriptures. Does that make sense? So they can't even understand this idea. What they cling to of hope is not real hope. What they cling to is what they consider life is not real life, okay? Okay, um, <clears throat> teaching, teaching is basically highlighting and establishing the standard. It's orthodoxy. You've heard me talk about this, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, or I'll talk about um, a plumb line. Um, so orthodoxy, y'all remember that term? Orthod orthodontist, straight, straight teaching, straight doctrine is what is taught, okay? Okay, let's go back to 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching and rebuke. I promise these next ones will go a little quicker, Okay. Uh, so, uh, all scripture inspired by God and beneficial for teaching and for rebuke. Now, basically, a, a rebuke is the next step when a Christian basically is not in line with the standard. So, when I talk about, a lot of times, um, I have a set of resolves that I look at occasionally. When my life seems to be out of whack or if my, if my walk doesn't seem to be right, I go back to this list that has just happened. I can't explain it. It's a long story. But anyway, it's these... Um, uh, these, these definitive things in my life that, that God has put there that basically gets me back on track. It's a plumb line. You know what a plumb line is? You know a little string with the little weighted thing at the bottom? Well, no matter how you mess with it, when you finally sit still, it goes straight down. Okay, that's the idea. It's a plumb line. Scripture does that. So in a rebuke, basically, is you're not in line with the standard, so basically the Christian needs to be called out. They need, to be, um, they need to be shown or uh, that they are out of line, right? So let's do some analogies, right? This is the idea of uh, it's to miss a block in football. Uh, it, you didn't turn a double play. Uh, use too small a wire for that voltage. Okay, so basically there's a standard that's been set by these guidelines, and you have missed the standard. You've missed the mark. A rebuke just lets you know that you missed it. It's to point you back to it, right? Um, no one in an authoritative position would overlook a misstep. Nobody. Uh, block this guy. Throw to second first. Use the right size wire. That's what you would happen. If, um, the example I told Bro Charles, I gave him a, a baseball analogy. And I'll probably mess it up because I don't know baseball that well. But, so I'm assuming that if there's maybe one out and you got a guy on first and the guy gets a base wrap to the shortstop, the first thing the shortstop should think of is to throw to second base and turn to innings over. 
that right? Yes. So, so, so that's, that is the teaching. This is the plumb line. So the shortstop grabs the ball. He throws it to first base, gets one out. The, first, the guy on first goes to second. Now there's only two outs, and they're still in the inning. That is the rebuke. This is when the coach steps in. He says, no, 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 that's not right. You, this is what you should have done, okay? That's the rebuke, okay? So then we go into the next step. Um, oh, well, hang on real quick. When I was talking about no one in a, an authoritative position would overlook a misstep, so this itself is an indictment on the feel-good preachers of today. If you are a preacher today and you see a Christian that is out of line or out of step, to not rebuke them is, is a, a direct conflict with Scripture, and, which means it is in contempt with the author of Scripture, with God. Okay, You are called or mandated to get someone back on track because you love them. No one, no one would do that. In any sport, if you miss your block, your coach would never be like, that's okay. They would get you back on track, right? Okay, so 2 Timothy 3, 16, beneficial for teaching, rebuke for correction. So now, the correction is recalibrating to the standard. Basically, it's pointing the person in the right direction. If rebuking is the negative, you miss the block, then correcting is the positive. Block this guy, right? I would say these are interrelated. You cannot have one without the other. You'll never have an example where you only rebuke someone and not correct them. That's what Christians do. Because there's a love and behind it. So you, want, you want the person to be um, in line, right? Is it real simple? So um, uh, you miss the block, like I said, that's the rebuke. So next time you should block this guy. That's the correction. Real simple. Are you seeing a pattern here? Let's look at the last one. He says, um, all Scripture is inspired by God, beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, and then for training in righteousness. Basically, what he's saying is you're going to do some work in this area. You're going to train. You're going to train in righteousness. This is the prescriptive pattern for training. Any training you've ever done in your entire life follows this pattern. There's a standard set by a coach, a teacher, however. You miss the, you miss the answer. Okay, that's the rebuke. Then they correct you, get you back on path. And then, then what? Then we're going to practice it again. We're going to look at this again. So here's the running play. You miss the block. You should have blocked this guy. What does the coach say? Run it again. This, that's the pattern. That's what he's showing you here. This is a training um, uh, prescription. Uh, you got a, got a man on first with one out. Ground ball hits the second baseman. He throws to first. Nope, you should have turned two. Run it again. Okay? Uh, this is spiritual training. The Bible possesses unparalleled authority in establishing doctrine, identifying and correcting error, and instructing in righteousness. Uh, remember this letter is a pastoral epistle, too, written to Timothy. So he was shepherding a flock, right? Um, look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 2. This is an instruction. So this is an admo um, admonishment from Paul as he instructs Timothy. And look at the correlation. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So if you were to look at these two passages side by side, preach, teach, Correct, correct, rebuke, rebuke, train in righteousness, exhort and instruct. Okay? This is what you this is what you're to do, Timothy, and scripture is how you're going to accomplish it. Um, the goal of this instruction, righteousness. Uh, this is the same idea when you look into the uh, the marriage deal and you're looking into in Ephesians when he talks about uh, men and women's responsibilities in marriage. But it's it tells the uh, the groom is to present the bride as a holy and blameless uh, sacrifice. That's, I'm not sure that's right. It, he's present, the, the groom is to present the bride as holy and blameless. Timothy is to present his flock as holy and blameless. This is how it takes place. It's, it's how it takes place, okay? That's his goal. Um, the training in mind is to produce conduct whereby righteousness is actualized. Take the actions necessary to intellectually understand the essentials of the faith to the point where you become convinced of them and committed to what has been taught, okay? So verse 17, and we'll wrap this up. <clears throat> so that the man or woman of God, we talked about that. This is the idea of all Scripture, all and every, for all of humanity, the inspired ones, the God-breathed ones. And he goes on to say, may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. So that the believer will, so so that the believer will be adequate sufficient for every good work that's what he's saying which means the whole point of this there's always a goal to the training 
the, tr the goal to this training is to be presented um, as righteous. And you know what righteous means? Righteous just means you're in right standing with God, okay? It means you're walking the same path that he's walking. It doesn't mean you mess up. When you, get me when you mess up, you get a rebuke, you get back on track, and you're walking in righteousness. That's the picture here, right? But what's really cool here is that Scripture is fully capable of, pre of presenting you this way and is equipped for every good work. So the idea is that um, because of Scripture, the believer can be presented as adequate or sufficient. Okay? If you want to, to walk in righteousness, Scripture can produce that in every believer. Okay? Now, so the, the sad thing is the converse is also true. Because without Scripture, you are completely incapable of walking in righteousness. All right? Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll close here. So, the goal, righteousness. Uh, the means, Scripture. The vessel would have been Timothy, the, the pastor or the elder. So, for the congregation, so from your perspective, um, think of it this way. If you are pursuing a goal, a banker, engineer, soccer player, bachelor's degree, a classical musician, and you had a scheduled routine, okay, <clears throat> How acceptable would 50% attendance be? How would that fly for you at college or school? You're not passing, <laughs> right? You're definitely, you're not, you're gonna, if you're in 11th grade and you, and you show up 50% of the time, you're going to be in 11th grade again, right? You're not advancing, okay? Um, so what, what about 25%? Imagine that one. So if you were to show up at church once a month, you are a 25 percenter. Try that in anything else you've ever done in your life. Try it. Let me know how it works out for you. Show me, t teach me your success story. That you show up for work um, two days out of uh, in a week, in two weeks. Two days, two weeks, and, and tell me how it works out for you in your occupation. Okay? Scripture is that essential. Scripture is that essential for the believer. It's the pattern for training. Um, but first of all, like I said, you've got to remember Scripture is salvific, okay? And always, always, always understand, this is important, that Scripture sits in complete authority over us. Brojo is not in complete authority here. Scripture sits in authority over him. Yep, and it's because it's God's inspired word, okay? It is the essence of who he is written on paper, right? I'll do this again. So as the essence of who God is, there's a straight line drawn with a crooked stick, right? That's the whole idea. But Scripture, y'all got to understand this idea, Scripture is essential, okay? It's a non-negotiable. Um, if you want to, I'm, I'm going to close with a, uh, just kind of a, we're not going to have an invitation today, but I do want you to, uh, I want you to think through these ideas. Um, and I, if you really have some concern about how much you buy into this idea of the authority of Scripture or the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, I would love for you to sit and visit with me because, like I said, this is essential. You will go no further in Christianity if you don't hold on to these things. You just won't. You, you will slowly become your own God. You'll start drawing your own rules. You'll start, you'll start working your own system. Um, and whether you, you'll start working your own system and, and you will fall short of what Scripture uh, was intended to.